to get to it here real quick. It's called an order of closure. It's a form. Anybody ever seen an order of closure? You've seen one? You've seen one? Okay. We'll get to that. They're going to come to you and they're going to ask you what? Here's the facts. Do you consent or not? Maybe you do. I've had clients. I said, you need to consent because I'll lose in a courtroom. That's okay. You're not closed for months. Well, it's not on the slide, but the law says they close you for 30 days and ask for an extension if necessary. That's what they have to prove. And the department must prove that they have taken all other reasonable means necessary and there's nothing else less restrictive. Do masks and social distancing work, folks? No. The, gov the government, again, being kind, the government says they do, right? They say, wear them. Yeah. Well, is it wearing masks? Because there's a rule, we're gonna get to the rule, the Department of Health rule, with masks, etc. If that works, and it's an effective way to control the spread, why do they need to shut down the indoor facility? That's right. Right? right? With me? If, if it works, great. Is, is trying to shut down your indoor facilities, is that tantamount to an admission that they really have no idea whether masks and social distancing work? That's right. I think that's a fair inference to make, right? You're entitled to notice, right? That your rights might be impacted. It's also in the law. Written notice shall be given to you. And I'm getting to the notice because I have one. But let's talk about what that notice has to say. Notice to the right of counsel. You have a right to an attorney to represent you. I told you this is a serious right. Taking your property right, stripping it away from you, people can't come inside your facility. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, which most of you business owners would be able to, that's okay. The court has to appoint one to you. Because keep in mind, this rule that I'm talking about doesn't just apply to closing of a business premise. It applies to isolation or quarantine of a citizen, right? If you want to tell a citizen, hey, stay in your house for 14 days because of some reason, they may not be able to afford an attorney. And actually, I, well, it wasn't, I represented an injured person. I volunteered. The court didn't appoint me. And we won, by the way. But you have the right to an attorney. They have to give you the reason for the closure. To see where it says isolation and quarantine, those are more related to individuals. The reason of the closure, they have to let you know whether it's an immediate order, because remember, an immediate one, then they have to have you in court in 48 hours, and the anticipated duration of the closure. And then if you go farther into the rules, the administrative rules, it says 30 days. They have to give you that. There we go. Let me, now I got to find, I want to show you guys this. Minimize that. There we go. Order for closure of a facility. This is a form that every health department in the county, if they don't have it, they're supposed to. But I would suggest to you, you may not see some of these from a health department because in their career, they probably never had to say, I gotta close a facility. And the, the COVID virus is not the end all of why you would do this. Let's say that you own a restaurant and there's an infestation of rats or bugs or food that's been poisoned or you know gone spoiled. They can close your facility for all kinds of health reasons. So it's not just an infectious disease. And right here you can see the type of order in section A. Do you voluntarily consent? Or is it immediate? And it doesn't have to be one of those two. If you don't voluntarily consent, they can just, and I'll get to that step in a second, they have to go to the state's attorney. Then you have to put the information. I want to come down right here. The Department of Public Health findings. Does anybody see anywhere in here where it says, my findings are that we can't control people at home or at church. I'm serious, you guys. You see that in here? So we got to do it at the bars and restaurants because we're the ones we can control. You see that? 
It says a reasonable belief exists that the place identified in this order is suspected of being contaminated with the following contagious or infectious disease. And it's based upon the following findings. Physical exam, laboratory testing, environmental exposure, etc. And then it says describe the facts and give the duration of the closure. This form couldn't even be filled out because they would have to list in there Resurgence mitigation based upon we believe people might be contracting it at bars and restaurants as well as other places But we can't to do anything about it. I mean, I'm being facetious, but you guys know where I'm going with that yeah. They can't even fill this form out Amen. Section E goes back to those legal rights that you have Okay, and I've already went through those rights but this form you see right here where it says 20 ILCS 2305 slash 2 C that's the law that I was reading to you. This form actually lays out your rights. This form is how it works, okay? And then you go to here, and then you can voluntarily consent. See that? You can consent. I'm gonna come back to that. Legal authority for this form. This order is issued pursuant to the authority contained in the Department of Public Health Act 20 ILCS 2305-2. If you consent, or if a court issues an order and then you don't comply, there could be consequences only after those things. And I'll come back to that later. But absent your consent or absent a court order, the potential penalty phase doesn't apply under this part of the law. I don't know. I know how to do this. It's a There we go. I'll remember that. I won't remember that. Okay. That's the law. Remember when I told you that the Department of Health can pass rules? Every administrative body can pass their own rules because when the legislature creates a law, like the Department of Health Act, and they create the administrative body, Department of Health, they have to have rules and procedures and guidelines on how they're going to operate that administrative body. The law doesn't lay that out. The law merely says you get to create these rules. Now, those rules have limits. You can't create a rule. For example, you can't create a rule. Remember everything I just read you about how you can close a business? The administrative body cannot create a rule. It says we're not going to pay any attention to that. That's imposing on the legislative branch's authority. The administrative body can't do that. But they can create rules. And if you read right here, it says, you know, this is the rule that they were creating. They're submitting a new emergency rule. Now, back in May, there was an attempt to submit a rule through the rulemaking process. The way that it works is there's two different ways to make rules. I'm not going to give you the long version of those. You can make a rule through the normal process, which takes a while, or you can do an emergency rule pretty quick. It can only last 150 days. It completely circumvents uh, a lot of public participation. I would again humbly suggest to you that this emergency rule was done as an emergency because they wanted to skirt tail your participation. But anyway, in May, that rule didn't pass, and that rule was going to try to create some enforcement of the masks, you know, the mask rule. They wanted to try to do that in May, and it ended up failing. And what happened is when they create that emergency rule, that emergency rule then goes to an, a, what's called JCAR. It's a Joint Commission of Administrative Rulemaking. It has 12 uh, people from the legislature on it. And they can vote to, it's, it's, it's opposite of what you would think. They can vote to suspend the rule. The rule's in effect immediately. They can suspend it. And that rule they tried to push through in May, it was going to call it the mask rule, was going to get suspended. They knew that. They didn't have the support because it could potentially fine citizens. We'll get to that. You guys can't be charged with a felony, but we'll come back to that. And so that rule got re rescinded by the governor and IDPH because they knew it was going to fail. Well, here we come back in August of 2007 with a new and improved rule. And I would, again, suggest to you, I know, that... Department of Health worked with the JCAR committee to 
amend that rule in a way that they would not suspend it. Okay? So the governor on August 7th, a few days before this rule went in front of the JCAR committee, it's 690.50, it's very important, to assist law enforcement, local boards of health, health authorities, states attorneys, and the general public in enforcing the use of face coverings and social gathering restrictions. Those are the governor's words there. And then the governor goes on to say, and I've highlighted it, he believed that this rule was a better option than the existing enforcement options, which was going to immediate license revocation. Now, again, I'm going to start real hard not to disagree with the governor, but I'm going to tell you that that underlying statement is not true. He was not trying to pass this rule to keep from having to go to immediate revocation. He was trying to pass this rule because without it, there was nothing that could remotely be enforced regarding masks, okay? He had had an executive order in place since May 1st regarding masks. Do you ever, you ever hear anybody getting fined for violating the executive order? He can't do it, guys. An executive order is clear. State police directors already made it clear. Not on the record, of course. We, don't, we can't enforce an executive order. There's nothing to write in a, in a law that we can cite. I've got a couple of tickets here that I'll talk to you about. If you're gonna charge somebody with something that has to be in writing in an executive order, you can't enforce it. So the governor was trying to create a rule regarding masks inside bars and restaurants so there would be an enforcement mechanism. Here's again, after the rule passed, the governor says these rules will ensure that there is a common sense way to enforce public health guidelines with an e emphasis on education first, okay? Rule 690.50, and it did not get suspended by JCAR. It is still a rule today. Okay? And this rule is something that I want you guys to understand because it's still there and I want you to understand what it says and I want you to understand what it doesn't say. This is just the beginning of that rule. This is parts of it where it says the Department of Health, again, has these general interests, you know, and they can take means necessary to suspress disease. What the means they can take is they can pass rules, they can create guidelines, etc. They can't just do what they want. You may hear a Department of Health official try to tell you, and they've told me in the past, well, that sentence right there says we can do what we want. You know what it can't do? It can't disregard Section 2C of the Illinois Department of Public Health Act, right? They can't just say this right here says we can just disregard the law. Somebody may try to tell you that. So here's this rule, and I want you to, again, I want to understand that this is why they created this rule. It is about they wanted to try to contain the disease. Any business, service facility, etc., open to the public over the age of two who can medically tolerate, don't really know how to define that, right. and unable to maintain social distancing. Again, that doesn't really apply to, apply to bars and restaurants. There's a lot of people that aren't a bar and restaurant can look at that and say, well, if we can maintain social distancing, do we have to uh, wear a mask? And I say, according to my interpretation of that, you do not, That's right? right? Yeah. But here you go. Business services facilities that offer food or beverages for in-person consumption may permit employees, customers, and other individuals to remove those coverings while eating or drinking. You guys are familiar with this rule. How many have been following it since it passed in August? Okay. I'll get to what, again, technically speaking, this rule is still in force. What that means could be different to every one of you depending on what county you're in, what city you're in, what the position of your health department is, etc. But that rule is still a rule, okay? And I, and I want us to understand that. I can tell you where I'm from. Three-fourths of the small businesses don't pay any attention to that. Amen. And we're in Region 4 where there's supposed to be no indoor dining. Three-fourths of them don't pay any attention. I think three-fourths is conservative. Okay, it also says you gotta take reasonable efforts to require patrons to wear the face coverings. And if you take reasonable efforts, you shall be in compliance with this section. Mr. Davies, do you know what reasonable efforts mean? Reasonable person, do you remember that in law school? Good, you remember? Whatever that judge that you're in front of thinks is reasonable, right? Reasonable person, but what this says, 
is you have to take reasonable efforts. And it gives you some ex explanations of what reasonable efforts to comply are, again, with the mask rule, I call it. Also in this rule under C4, it says it limits your gatherings of people. Okay, so it's in that rule. And it also says in the rule, and it cites the provision of the law, that local boards of health, police officers, sheriffs, etc., you know, can enforce this rule. Okay, this rule says if you're a bar or restaurant owner, you have to have a mask on unless you're set eating and drinking, and you as business owners have to make reasonable efforts to make sure that they comply with that. And your de Department of Health, or your city sheriff, or county sheriff, your city chief, my county sheriff, he reads that, he just laughs. I don't know what yours will do. Uh, but that's what the rule says. Enforcement. I didn't say it at the beginning, but I'll say it now. When you're dealing with, I always use this analogy, an analogy with children. I, again, I have three children, and we as parents have rules, right? We create the rules. We're in charge, right? And if you tell your child, let's say if they're clever, this is the rule. Okay, Dad, that's the rule. What if I don't follow that rule, Dad? I don't know. Tommy's my son's name. I don't know Tommy. I'm not sure I can do anything about it. You gotta follow that rule? Of course not. And I'm being facetious, but anytime there's a rule or a law, there's a corresponding consequence if you don't follow it, if it's enforceable, right? You create all the rules you want. If you don't have a way to enforce them, it's, it's guidance, right? Have you been confused over the last six months on what's guidance and what's a rule and what's a mandate, right? I'm telling you that's happening on purpose. It's happening on purpose. I have yet to understand you know, you guys know about the court cases going on. I'm not going to talk about them, but some judges say, yeah, the governor can do this executive order. Some say he can't. Okay. I don't care. What are you going to do with the executive order? If you don't follow an executive order, there's been an executive order that says you had to wear a mask since May. I haven't worn a mask. The only time I wear a mask when I go to court or if I go into a business and I respect their wishes. I don't wear one. Nobody's come to me with my ticket. I've got a ticket here that I'll talk about later. So here's your ticket for violating the executive order. Right? This talks about the enforcement of this rule. Okay? And this is something, again, you guys, we're going to come back to this, but I'm pointing out now. Read the second sentence. No individual shall be held responsible for compliance with this rule on behalf of a business, service, facility, or organization, even if the individual is an owner. This rule shall be enforced by business for businesses, facilities open to the public, not against an individual. Do you know why that was added? Because back in May, when they tried to pass this same rule, there was so much pushback from the possibility that an individual citizen could be charged with something that it was never going to get anywhere. So now they say, oh, we can't charge an individual, we can charge a business. Right? right. So I heard somebody say to me earlier today, I think a reporter asked me about it too, that there's a local health department official that says you as a citizen can be charged with a felony if you don't comply with something. And to the extent that was said, that threat in and of itself is probably a criminal offense by a public official. It's criminal intimidation. You can't be charged with anything as an individual, according to this rule. Hey, hey Tom, can I correct that real quick? Yeah. So we were told by Todd Marshall two days ago that if we didn't comply with the health department that they would issue, not them, but since someone would issue a felony on us, the business owner, for staying open. Okay. That's what was told to us. So somebody named Todd Marshall, I don't know who he is. I, I can give you more detail on that. I wasn't involved with any Fosberg. Okay. So anyway, if it happened two days ago, I just got asked about it today. There is no state's attorney, no law enforcement, no health department can charge a citizen for violating this rule with anything, let alone a felony. Because it says right there, and if you listen to the JCAR hearing, I listened to the whole thing back on August 11th, the legislature hammered on the Department of Health and the governor's office to make crystal clear that no individual citizen would ever be at risk for penalty. Okay? So you can't be. It wasn't from the health department. Yeah, he'll, he'll, yeah. I, I was on the call with the Winnebago County Health Department okay. every day at 9.30 for the last three weeks with about 11 people. 
We asked for several days, what happens if we say no to closing? They didn't have an answer, didn't have an answer. Tuesday morning, they had an answer from the Winnebago County Health Department chair, the head of the Winnebago County Director. The administrator or the president of the board? Town Marshal, the director. Okay. He said, Governor Pritzker has informed us that he has directed the state's attorney to send the state police to your restaurant or your bar if you refuse to close okay. and you will issue issue you a felony under the Infectious Disease Act and the Public Health Act. And that is how their power is. And once you have a felony, you can never have a liquor license or a gaming license. I don't agree with that, but that's what they told so this huge rule, group of us. So, so if I understand correctly, this gentleman told you that the governor told him. That was the very scripted answer <laughs> gotcha. from the Winnebago County Health Department, which okay. most of okay. us the infectious disease the communicable disease rule this is it they're talking about right nobody's getting charged with a felony if somebody gets charged with a felony call me i'll represent you for free okay it's not going to happen so so again as it relates to that rule that rule is still in force today. It says, regardless of who may enforce it, again, enforcement and rules, keep them separate. The rule 690.50 says that if you own a bar or restaurant, you're supposed to have people wear a mask and let them sit down eating or drinking, and you can't have more than the occupancy that they say. That's still a rule today. Does that mean you have to follow it? That's not, uh, I'm not here to say you don't. I'm here to say that's the rule that you're supposed to follow, whether or not your local health department or any other local official is going to enforce it, that is specific to where you live. I can tell you I know where I live and most of the counties, the health departments are not pushing that issue. But again, I'm not here to say that you don't have to because it is a rule, okay? That's not why we're here because I want you to know what this rule doesn't say, which is what we're getting to. What does it not say? You can't have indoor dining. Is it in this rule? Right? And we're going to get to it, but down in Region 4 and in Region 7, when they re went backwards, do you know what rule they're citing to say you can't have indoor dining? This one. There, and, and the people I've talked to, I'm thinking of my friend Ashley, God love her, when they came in there and said, you know what, and they got a notice of non-compliance that I'm getting to, that you got indoor dining and you can't do that, you're violating this rule. She had a copy of the rule and she says, well, I've got it right here. It says that my people have to wear masks and I can't have more than this many people. What else you got? They didn't have an answer. Okay? So I wanted to be, I pointed out this rule because I want you to know what it says and what it doesn't say. So if you are violating this rule, because you're going to hear this, they're going to give you a written notice of non compliance. Okay? And they're going to give you a reasonable opportunity to take prompt actions to comply with subsection C. And I've been across the state. What's reasonable opportunity depends on where you're at. Some have said an hour. Some have said a day. Some have said 48 hours. There is no rhyme or reason to that. Reasonable. Most of them, again, it will give you two notices of non-compliance. You just changed that to one. Okay. Mo they sent out an email and said you have one notice of non-compliance and then you get uh, a misdemeanor. Well. If they want to go to one, so be it, but they're skipping a step, which we're going to talk about now. Because you see here, that was first. Second. Second is not misdemeanor. Second is, is that if the notice of noncompliance of the mass or the capacity limits doesn't work, they can issue an order to disperse. What does an order to disperse sound like? An order of closure? Now, this, this was a clever way for people that write this stuff, that think people aren't looking. Remember when I told you in order to close your business, you gotta have consent or a court order. Well, we're not gonna close your facility without a court order. We're just gonna tell all your patrons they gotta leave. Yes. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, know, you can be open, but nobody can come in. Okay. So my argument has always been, order to disperse is tantamount to an order of closure requires a court order, so this provision of this rule violates the statute. I've never had to argue that in the courtroom yet because nobody's ever been forced closed. I gotta tell you guys, I won't tell many stories, but this rule first came out 
down in Clinton County, which is about five hours south of here, we got a uh, American Legion, and I'm pretty sure the people that go in that American Legion have earned the right to be free, right? I think they have, don't you? And so this lady's working at the American Legion, and she was having a wedding reception. And the health department, I love the health department in Clinton County, they're a nervous wreck because I've had them going in. I'm, I live 30 minutes from there, and I've had them in pieces for months. They don't even know what to, they, they actually did an a, a interview and said, we don't even know what to do anymore. We just leave people alone. So, but anyway, that wasn't working. So they, here comes the state police. And the rank and file state police offers in this state are as good as they come, in my opinion. The rank and file. The administration is being leaned on by you know who. And so here comes state police rank and file officers to my American Legion, telling them clearly we got no desire to be here. We don't even know what we're doing. You can't have people inside that building uh, over 25% or 50% of the occupancy. Well, oh yeah, you're, you're under the resurgence mitigation now, so this rule doesn't apply. It's 25%. Again, it's all ridiculous. Lady says, okay, what do you want me to do? Well, you got to tell the young kids in there just got married, they got to leave. She says, I'm not doing that. And she doesn't know she can't go in. You're talking about felonies up here, down there. They're telling her she's going to jail. She, she didn't know any different. They said, we'll be back in 30 minutes. Her reasonable efforts were 30 minutes. They come back in 30 minutes. She says, well, they still, they're still in there. I'm not telling them to leave. They give her a second notice of noncompliance. She said, I'll be back in 30 minutes. She says, okay, I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, she called. And, and I've known her for, since high school. I haven't seen her in 20 years. And uh, I now represent them. And so they come back in 30 minutes, and she comes out, and she's telling me the story. She comes out with her hands out, like this. <laughs> she says, you're going to have to take me to jail because I'm not going to tell those kids that they got to ruin their wedding because they postponed it in April. And now here we are a month ago. State police looks at her and says, all right, uh, hold on. He calls legal the Illinois State Police, and I know what they were talking about, and that's a longer conversation. They looked at her and said, okay, we're leaving. They never been back. And they didn't want to be there in the first place. Again, I'm, I got nothing but good things to say about those officers. They didn't want to be there. And so that's one, and that one, that was a ripple because when she did that, guess what happened? Other businesses started saying, we're going to stand up for ourselves. Other businesses started saying, they're going to stand up for themselves. And it rippled. So what she did, she didn't realize how big an impact that it had. But anyway, when they tried to tell her she had to disperse, she said, I'm not dispersing. They knew they couldn't order her to disperse. The, the attorney on the phone did because they didn't have a court order. Can I ask you something real quick? Sure. How many 30-day uh, executive orders did our governor give us? <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that. Do you guys want me to give that to you? I'll do it quick. Well, you know, I want it. Can he go with you know, I won that case, right? You know, I won that You know, I won that case, right? Yeah. All right, the Illinois, I'm, I'm going to throw this in. It's not part of the script, so if you want to stop me, go ahead. But this is important. You guys need to understand this because our citizenry is going to have to become more informed about how this stuff works. We have the Illinois Emergency Management Agency Act, 20 ILCS 3305, right? And it says, and it was created, you know, really modified after 9-11 because it was dealing primarily with those types of disasters, you know, uh, people using agents, infectious agents on a, you know, what do they call it, bioterrorism type of stuff. And it says in there that there are certain things that are a disaster, right? A public health emergency is a disaster. A public health emergency can be a novel or infectious disease that has a high probability of causing death or other serious illnesses. So on March 9th, the governor issued a proclamation of disaster saying that COVID-19 was a public health emergency, okay? Under Section 7 of that act, it says, if we have a public health emergency, the governor has certain enumerated emergency powers, and it lists about 14 of them. One of them says he can control the ingress and egress of people within a disaster area. He interpreted that language to mean he could shut down your bars and restaurants. Judge McKinney in Clay County disagreed with him and said this law controls the closure of bars and restaurants and not some vague interpretation of that law, okay? That was one of the things that happened, and I agree. And, but beyond that, 
The governor interpreted it that he could, that power. In that law, it says, upon the issuance of a proclamation of disaster, those emergency powers last 30 days, okay? There's nothing in that law that says your disaster proclamation, because the proclamation is different than the executive order. Once the proclamation is issued, then you can do executive orders, regardless of whether they have properly been done or not. You know, as far as can they close businesses, set that aside. There's nothing in the law that says that proclamation of disaster has to have a date in it. We would all think as intelligent people, well, if we have a proclamation of a disaster for COVID and it's a disaster, it's going to run until it's no longer a disaster, right? No, 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 no. What the governor did is he put an artificial 30-day end date in the proclamation so it would expire on its own terms. And so when that 30 days ended on that proclamation, what did he do? He issued a second proclamation and says that re-energizes his emergency powers for another 30 days, right? Then at the end of that 30 days, he does another one. Now, what I argued to the court, I said, look, you have to have a threat or an occurrence of a public health emergency on the date you issue that proclamation, right? What is the threat or occurrence on that day? I conceded on March 9th that that may have existed. I questioned it, but I conceded it. I said 30 days in, what was the occurrence that caused the second proclamation? It's not COVID. It was the artificial 30-day end date that he put in the first one. That was the occurrence that caused the second one to come, right? Yeah. So that fiction that was created is what gave him these 30-day powers into perpetuity. And there have been judges that have said that that's proper. Judge McKinney said no. He says, we're not going to interpret this statute to say that you could put an artificial end date into the proclamation that is not required just so it'll expire and you can do a new proclamation so you can do new 30-day emergency powers. That's, that's what that case is all about. And when this is all done, Mr. Cabello, I hope that the legislature does a good job of cleaning up that act so this never happens again, yeah. okay? Yeah. I'm on a subcommittee of the Human Rights Committee of the uh, State Board, and that's one of the things that I care about. This act has to be cleaned up. There is not one of you in here that I would believe that would say, yeah, we can create this fiction so this extraordinary power can be given to the executive branch of government until there's no longer COVID, right? No, that, that executive power needs to expire and then the legislative branch of government, who we can vote in and out and we can holler at them because they're local to us, they go in there and they figure out because they're our voice. They decide how we protect the public health going forward, not the executive officer wielding power like a king into perpetuity. No disrespect to our governor. I don't care who the governor is. I would not want that to happen and we need to fix that. So that answers your question, sir.